from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to Face the State here on the Montana Television Network. We thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. I'm Jay Cohn and I'm joined today by a, a panel of uh, experts from the Montana media. We'll be talking about the changing role of media in our lives today. Let's introduce you to our panel. We uh, promise you a lively discussion. Daryl Ehrlich is sitting next to me, the editor of the Billings Gazette. He's been editor since 2013 and has a long uh, career with the Lee Enterprises, with stops in Casper most recently, La Crosse, Winona, Minnesota. And Daryl, you're a Billings native to boot, so we have to like you, right? Well, I hope. Thanks so much. <laughs> in the middle, we have Jackie Yamanaka, the news director of Yellowstone Public Radio. She's going to add some perspective on the radio side of things for us. She's been news director since 1986. Jackie, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> it's a long time, yeah. over 30 years. <laughs> How did that happen? That's what you're asking Yeah, now. I know. Where did time go? Jackie uh, informed us today she's a, a graduate of Custer County High School in Miles City, so we're excited to have Jackie with us. Last but not least, at the end of our panel is my boss, John Stepanek, news director at KTVQ here in Billings, a job he's held since 1994, John. Seems like just yesterday we met. Yeah, no, <laughs> no but it's been a long time. We've gone through a lot of news stories together. Uh, Jay, do a good job today, Okay, will you? pressure's on. <laughs> well, we want to talk uh, first a little insight into what these uh, people do on a daily basis. Daryl, as editor of the Gazette, I don't think anyone really knows what a typical day in your life is. Give us uh, a quick walkthrough, if you would. Well, you know, one of the things that is interesting about uh, the editor is, that, is people believe that you read everything because you're the editor, and <laughs> that, that's just not the truth. Uh, we have a great team of, of editors and reporters who help put out the paper. Uh, my, my day is, is great because I don't know what I'm going to, to face from day to day. And so if you like consistency, if you like doing the same thing and knowing what your schedule is, you'll hate this job. <laughs> But uh, I get in, I check email, I check uh, voicemail, I, I go through what we did in the paper, and then we, we're always looking at tomorrow. So, so today is done, Sunday is done. Uh, it's always gonna be Monday or the next day or the next day. And we are watching social media, we're watching email, we're watching uh, what other media in the state are doing. It's, it's kind of information uh, overload at times, <laughs> right. and that's what makes it so interesting. It's a it's the most fascinating job because you don't know. Uh, it's an adventure. Kind of drinking like the fire hose and not sure what's coming down the hose. Yeah, and having to be able to say, okay, well, we planned one thing, but now we're going in a completely different direction, and you have to be okay with that. Jackie's shaking right. her head in absolutely. The it's it's embracing change. So for the longest time, when I first started, I was a one-person newsroom. So I anchored in the morning, then did reporting. So slowly, the newsroom is growing. Um, I'm still a working reporter. My beat is Montana and Wyoming. And a lot of that falls to covering the state house, government, politics, which then of course means you cover environment, schools, economy, everything. So there's many things. And just like Daryl, it, it's information, information, information. Things are coming in. You think you have a story planned and it's like, whoops, breaking news. And you go off in that direction. I, know, I think one of the big challenges for you on that front and for any reporter in our region is you have to be a little bit of an expert on everything. I mean, if you want to look at economic, government, uh, transportation, travel, tourism, I mean, the, a little bit of expertise is required in a wide variety of areas to be a reporter and, and certainly an anchor in this area. Certainly the news world has uh, changed so dramatically, and let's just talk about the speed, not necessarily the speed at how fast the change has occurred, which is lightning speed, but how quickly these stories develop and go viral, as we say in this day and age. Most recently, the uh, assault with uh, Greg Gianforte, the Republican candidate for the U.S. House and the reporter from The uh, Guardian. I mean, that was uh, maybe the perfect storm of stories because so much attention was focused on that race at the time with the new mm -hmm. presidency, but also that this reporter wasn't from a small podunk newspaper, and The Guardian is one of the biggest voices in the world. Were you amazed at that, Daryl, how quickly it was like, whoa, we, we were behind the eight ball on this? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I think is freeing, you know, the, the good thing about the information overload is that when you have all this information and it's out there, you know, as opposed to 20 or 50 years ago where the number of outlets you had reporting information was a lot smaller. So you had an obligation to report just as, as wide as you could. Now you can actually focus 
on some things specifically. So I think one of the great advantages to our information in today's day and age is that you can you can really get to what people want and not have to have the responsibility of covering everything uh, you know kind of a, a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, we were shocked at how quickly you know the Ben Jacobs Guardian thing happened on Twitter. Uh, we, we first saw it and mm -hmm. all we had was a sentence that said uh, Greg Gianforte has body slammed me I believe was something to the effect and I think it left all of us I don't know I'd love to know what but <laughs> we were stunned by it we, we looked at it and we said what does this even mean because we had no context there's not a oh yeah just another politician body slamming right. a, a reporter <laughs> there's yeah I, I don't know about you but, but it was it was it, it took a while for it happened so quickly that we couldn't even we couldn't even tell our our readers uh, what it meant. Well, it was hard to even verify what we exactly. were hearing before yeah. suddenly the national media had it, the international media was going with it. Jackie, you were saying uh, you were just kind of standing back going, whoa. Well, I mean, what happens with Twitter is it's sort of this unfiltered, unverified. And what do we do as reporters? I mean, we get information, and especially something like this, you want a second source because, I mean, granted, it is first source, right? It is the reporter, Ben Jacobs. But at the same time, you're thinking, what? Is this? Is this true? It, you're just <laughs> incredulous, you know, jaw drop, it just hanging open. Did this really happen? And then you're trying to figure out, okay, now what? And I think that is the role of the media to take that next step and to, to, to explain, to get some of the background, what happened? Why did it happen? and put some context right. and sideboards on that. And John, some, you were, you some were. verification, but at the same time, once the audio came out and the Guardian, Guardian uh, posted right. the, the audio, when Ben put that up, I think we all took a step back and went, okay, this is now a real serious situation that we have to uh, take a look at this, this evening for the rest of the night, uh, for tomorrow. What does it mean for uh, you know, election day? Was the next day? Uh, we haven't encountered anything quite like the seriousness of that event on the day before the election that first needed to be vetted as far as right. is it true. Ben Jacobs is a great reporter for The Guardian, who's not to think that that happened, get a, uh, another verification from witnesses at the scene, and then the audio tape uh, with it, and all of a sudden we had uh, probably one of the biggest stories and certainly events in political history in the state. Well, one of the things we struggled with too, John, and I, I think you bring up a good point, was had this happened a week ago, the, the timing would have still been, I mean, it still would have happened very quickly. But the timing was even more crucial because you've got a candidate on election night. And so voters are going to go, you know, 12 hours, voters are going to be voting if they're doing, if they haven't done mail ballot. And I think if, you're, if you've been in the business as long as, as we have, we see the, the, the people who try to, to drop a bombshell on us. One, right. You know, both right. camps are always right. trying to get that last minute last zinger dig. in, you know? Right. And we're used to it. But this was something, there, there was no model for this. And we also, I think all of us understood that reporting something this shocking could have very serious consequences. And it's at the, those moments that you feel kind of a very heavy burden and responsibility as a journalist because you don't want people to say your media organization uh, changed the whole outcome of the election. Right. And John, you were saying in this day and age where we're pushing news, where people have their smartphones and we're telling them what's going on, in that case, we wanted to push the story we weren't sure. <laughs> First we had to verify, but it was going out before we could even decide whether to push it or not. And, w and we have to be careful with that uh, in our situation because, yes, we do want speed to be part of the delivery that we are are conscious of but at the same time truth and accuracy is far more important than than the speed factor but in this case there were so many reports getting out both from uh, Twitter social media on Facebook uh, just through uh, active websites uh, we broke into programming that right. night uh, I told you that <laughs> you need to get on the air on this one Jay uh, we're gonna break into programming because this is a, a of such uh, magnitude that uh, it's unprecedented and we need to let people know so uh, trying to get out in front and, and speed was important in this but 
I, I just I couldn't echo uh, your thoughts any better uh, that getting this one right and the the consequences of getting that of not being right on election night going into right. that last day of the campaign was just something we and, had and to make I, sure we were right. And I think I have to go back to the planes hitting the World Trade Center because that happened during all of the live national shows, whether it's CBS This Morning, whether it's NPR's Morning Edition. And it was all like of a six, sudden, six fifty-five in the morning. I remember right. Alex Tyson was on and, television on Q two, and, all you and there can was say, a plane crash. Right, the and all you can Center. say is we're getting word. So yes, you know, and you're trying to update your listeners. You're trying to remind them that this is happening while we're on the air. We're trying to verify, and I think it's communicating to the public that we really are in the pursuit of truth. Yeah, well, okay. especially, yeah, especially in this day and age with the whole fake news as an issue in our world today. Did that affect you as you looked at this story? I was like, is this, well first, is this fake or not? And you don't want to be, get colored as those, as you mentioned earlier, uh, acts to grind on one side or the other. Sure, well, you know, that's the easiest. <coughs> now, now if you don't like anything, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you fall on, it's just fake. And that's an easy way to discount it. But I think that what it, it's a good reminder that it, information does happen so fast that we do have that obligation. One of the things that happened at the Gazette was, as this is happening and it's, it's lighting up Facebook and Twitter, we have people calling us saying, are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Why, why don't we see it up there? And we're reminding them that we're trying to understand what this means. And our job's not just to echo or mirror, it's also to verify because putting it out there, you know, you don't hold Twitter to the same standards that you hold KTVQ, Yellowstone Public Radio, or the Gazette to, and that's a great thing, we think. Right. But it does take some time, and we, <laughs> I remember one of the more bizarre conversations I had, which is, what's the definition of body slam? I mean, <laughs> we know what it means, but what does it really mean in this context? Because body slam is, it sounds like such an incredible term that we wanted to make sure we understood what that meant. So we were having discussions and looking up <laughs> dictionary definition. So what is the definition of body slam? Well, it's a good point because uh, just this week, our uh, Capitol reporter Mike Dennison filed a story with an update on this and referred to the incident as uh, Greg Gianforte shoved the reporter down to the ground. We had an email immediately demanding we take that off the air because that's not what happened. That was fake news. But what is your definition of shoving someone to the ground? Is that what do you? Is that a body slam? I don't. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't but know. it definitely wasn't fake news. And I, the bottom line is we don't know really what happened. Ben Jacobs has his version. We're going to have uh, someone appearing in court soon. You would think in Gallatin County uh, we might get more of a description then of exactly what happened. But uh, when Ben Jacobs said, well, you just broke my glasses and body slammed me, and the silence after that, if, if you were the one doing the body slamming, would you say, no, I didn't? <laughs> but I had a, my, one of my sons called who heard that recording and said all that you could hear were crickets. There was <laughs> silence from the, the candidate and that, that momentary silence was pretty telling, it yeah. seemed like. Jackie, you're shaking your head. Well, have we just come to the point, if we take away the fact that Ben Jacobs is a journalist, have we come to the point now in our society where an act of violence culminates because you disagree. I mean, it that, that, way. that <laughs> is, you know, the <coughs> overarching question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how did it go from zero to 60? And, and now in this environment that we are in right now where deplorable people, you know, fake news, liars, whatever you want to call it. Enemies of the American people. I right. know, but our president and, called and the, yet, yeah. you know, it's First Amendment, freedom of the press, you know, holding our public officials and others accountable, because remember, there are public servants, and what is wrong with asking them questions? We did not force them to run for public office. And we are just, it would be great in a utopian world where the public did attend regularly the city council meetings, the legislature, the school board, and they, you know, went to shareholder meetings. I mean, you name whatever meeting you want. You know, we're there to watch and report. 
Yeah. And, and how did we become the enemy, you know, all of a sudden? Certainly, because people disagree. Certainly part of our biggest tenets is publicizing issues, mm -hmm. in informing the public about important items, and then holding government officials accountable. I mean, our watchdog role is certainly uh, something that we uh, hold very near and dear to our hearts. But it has turned sour uh, for many people in the public, not all, but some. And I, th I think people more and more today are, feel emboldened to lash out at the, at the media for their reporting on whatever issue uh, they take objection to. And, and certainly uh, with the current president, uh, he, he probably commands more of a controversial and, and polarizing effect than, than anybody I've ever covered. I think the first time when, when uh, candidate Trump came to Billings and I, I'm not sure if you guys were there, but standing on the media podium, he pointed at us, and those are the people who are after me, except you, Carl Cameron at Fox mm -hmm. News. Yeah. I like you, uh, but <laughs> the right. rest of I them, and, and people turned around and booed at us. That was right. the first time that I'd ever felt that. Obviously, we get taken to task uh, on a more personal and individual basis, but that was the first time that right. I felt a collective boo uh, heading our way. That was a collective uneasy feeling on, nope, the, it uh, really on the media was. dais. So, Darrell, I want to ask you, uh, your newspaper yeah. took the extraordinary step of taking away the endorsement to Greg Gianforte over this incident. Yep. Um, and you, I think I read the, the editorial that you wrote. You said it was the first time you've written one under deadline. It was, uh, <laughs> tell us about that conversation as the, you just tried to decide, do we need to do this? Yeah, well, I think one of the things, uh, a lot of people were upset with us. You know, uh, endorsements uh, make people happy or mad, depending on, mm -hmm. on where you stand. That's fine. And we did it, you know, we, we came out with the endorsement two weeks before this. So you couldn't have possibly known. And we took, a, you know, our... Our editorial endorsement of Mr. Gianforte was was qualified, and so we took him at his word. And but we what what happened after we heard the tape, after we saw the eyewitness account, and after the Gallatin County Sheriff ticketed him, we just said we can't support someone who would assault another human being. I think a lot of people see this as we were supporting him because he took after a reporter. No this person just happened to be a reporter, but it wasn't because he was a reporter. And so we talked about it, and we said, we just can't stand behind it. It's just not, uh, we, we had a lot of people who were saying, now what do you say, now what do you say, now what do you say? Um, we are comfortable on the opinion page taking controversial or unpopular stands. However, in no way or sh shape or form could it, uh, did we want this, the, the, anybody to believe that we stood behind this. And so uh, it was about a 45 minute time. Uh, the decision was made about 45 minutes before we went to press. And we, we, uh, I was the chief writer of that editorial. And we, <laughs> it was quick. Uh, it, thankfully, my, my days as a news reporting journalist served came me in well. Handy. Yeah, came in very handy. But we decided that we just couldn't, uh, couldn't stand by it. And we rescinded it. And there's no playbook to, in my 21 year career in journalism. I can't think of rescinding an, edi an endorsement editorial, but we did, and so did uh, our sister paper in in Missoula, and then also Helena. And did yeah. they do that independently? Or yeah, did, yeah. Okay. Every the independent uh, the editorial boards are independent, and we we just all after seeing that, it's just not something that we we could stand by, and and we listed our reasons, but it it, it was it was also something that happened on the night before election, but we believe that we would rather people criticize us for, for doing that, and but understand where we stood than to be silent and make people believe that, that this was something we agreed with. The statement from the Gianforte campaign about this incident, I think, poured more fuel on the fire. In fact, you mentioned it in your editorial, defending the indefens uh, indefensible. Um, in that, they said it was a liberal reporter, almost like using that as an excuse that it was okay. Back to your point, Jackie, is it okay to attack someone because you disagree with them? Did you read that into their statement there? Is, did that disturb well, you? Well, it, it was just very disturbing that somehow by labeling an individual as a liberal reporter, that all of a sudden that justifies the action. This was an indiv individual, certainly. This individual just happened to be doing his job. Gene Forte apologized, but it took him longer than 24 hours to do so and only did it after he won the election. John, were you surprised it took him that long? Um, do you think he would have apologized had he lost? 
Uh, no, I, honest, quite honestly, uh, I don't know that he would have. I think he would have um, just, uh, as many people do when they lose an election, you don't hear from them for, for quite some time. So it wouldn't have surprised me just in, in because of that. Uh, I thought that, uh, you know, strategically, I'm sure that they were trying to figure out what's the best plan in, in this case. There's no playbook for it, and so they were trying to uh, do, do the best they could. I felt that he should have come out the next day, during the day. Um, so many people had already voted in the state of Montana. That gets lost on, uh, yeah. and on criticism of this state in this situation from national and outside uh, members of the media. I thought he would have. I actually thought that his uh, speech that night was very sincere. Uh, had he given that same apology 12 hours earlier, I think he would have served himself well. I mean, and to, to wait until that, until he had won the election uh, felt a little hollow to me. If, Even, it, yeah. if it would have been at noon, I think uh, that would have been a better idea and we would have covered that live. Do endorsements matter anymore, Daryl? Uh, I, I think you would say I do, just <laughs> the amount of emails you got over the, the most yeah. recent endorsements. Well, you know, they're never, people I think misunderstand endorsements, that they're supposed to, we're supposed to be some kind of kingmaker. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they add to, and the, one of the reasons we come out with endorsements early is because we want to give people a chance to chew on something, to think about something. I think they do, and I think one of the reasons they do is because we have them in for editorial board interviews, and we ask the questions, and we, like you, cover the candidates every day. So our perspective is we spend a lot of time with these people, especially on the campaign trail, so we try to make a qualified opinion based on the issues at hand, based on the candidates we have, here's who we think is, are the best choices. So some people have said, you know, the Gazette editorial is a kiss of death, others say it helps them. <laughs> I, I'll, let, I'll let readers decide on that, but I, I do think they matter because they are one of the ways that we hold in our profession that we hold leaders to accountability. I was going to ask you, <laughs> how difficult was writing that first line of uh, retraction of an endorsement uh, on that night when you were on deadline? Because that had to be something very new for you. Uh, well, as one person said, we, well, the, the opening line is we're at a loss for words, then we go on with for a lot of words. So <laughs> it's probably not completely true that we were. But, but it was hard because where do you start? Where do you where begin? Do you and I, yeah. I didn't have a playbook. And I think it was really important for us to say that we we mean this sincerely. We 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 chose wrong, uh, we chose incorrectly uh, by by uh, when we trusted him, and and that we we took it uh, we took it back, and, and here are the reasons that we're doing it. And uh, for those of you who thought we shouldn't have done this in the first place, we can't possibly have seen into the future. No one can predict uh, whether it's shoving, body slam, assault, whatever term you want. No one no one can predict that. Um, so I don't think uh, I don't think that it was a. Uh, I, th I hope we laid out our, our our rationale for doing it, but it was it was a very that blank screen. It seemed like a lot longer than yes. it was because you stand <laughs> you just stare there and you go, <laughs> okay, where do you begin with this one? Right, no. yeah. John. Do debates matter anymore in elections? Uh, uh, we had an interesting situation with our debate in the special house uh, congressional race where uh, the libertarian candidate. Uh, got a whole social media movement behind him to get him included in the debate even though at first he didn't meet our criteria to get in but uh, tell us a little bit about that do they matter debate debates this in this day and age where you have so many media platforms to choose from uh, is that still a factor I still think they do because it puts the candidates on stage for a lengthy period of time asking questions uh, from a group of journalists that you you don't know what they're going to ask. So certainly the, the questions are important. Um, and it m gives viewers or listeners or readers an opportunity to see the candidate without a script, without an ad in, you know, for, in front of them. Uh, and I think that's really important because you get an understanding of, of who these people really are. What do they believe? You can do some probing questions both from a personality uh, character standpoint and from a policy uh, standpoint that you just that you can't do in any other kind of format. So I, I, I certainly do agree uh, that they're important and we'll continue to, to do them. Jackie likes debates, I see. Well, it, think of it as a job interview is yes. what it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. is exactly well, what it point. is. And you know, no notes. Um, they don't again, 
they don't know what questions are coming and it really gives the audience that unfiltered view in this day and age of of questioning our credibility there it is well i think the other thing that's important too is you're seeing the trend of a lot of uh, a lot of politicians um, ducking town halls or not right. not being kind of publicly accessible this makes them publicly accessible so I would argue that debates are probably more important now you know what was it Dorothy Bradley and Mark Roscoe did 31 debates right we're lucky if we can get one that was I a few too one. many <laughs> <laughs> okay so there there were <laughs> we'll shoot for a middle yeah. but somewhere between yeah, yeah. no I, and you know and media organizations are joining forces to try to encourage candidates because it is so difficult to get them to commit. Do you do it in the studio? Do you have a live audience? Who's there? It, it, you, it comes down to the minute details. Right. Yes. Your green room is better than my green room. Yep, and how, uh, what's the format and who's invited and who gets, you know, even to the, the flip of the coin to who gets the first question. And it if is, he gets the first question, uh, do I get the first question? And can he wear a cowboy hat? Can he wear a cow <laughs> cowboy, cowboy hats question. are really important issues here. Well, I we, told you guys this was going to fly by. We have a minute and a half left. <laughs> Final question is, given what we've discussed, uh, the state of journalism, the state of the world of politics, would you advise someone to go into our profession these days? Absolutely, but I would, do, I would say go in with eyes wide open, understanding that there are more expectations, there are fewer journalists, and, um, and the bar is higher because I think it's causing uh, e uh, journalists to have to write better, be clearer, keep the reader's attention, and they're bombarded. So. Um, just know that the stakes are a lot higher than, than they've ever been. Jackie, right. you're the I'd last. Say, I'd say the core is still pursuit of truth on many platforms, whether it's Twitter, <laughs> yeah. Facebook, on, you know, print. And John, we uh, still do a newscast every night. We have to remind ourselves of that. Because we do so four many every yeah. day, and then we <laughs> try to cover the rest uh, with, you know, social media and the other digital platforms. So. It's a wonderful way to make a living. Your first look at uh, history, we usually get uh, a glimpse of it, and there's, uh, that's why I've been in the business all my life. What did you say earlier, Daryl? If you like uh, we weekends if and you, holidays. If you, if you value your, your weekends <laughs> Christmas, and your nights, holidays. Yeah, and, 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 and you like spending time away from your family, I would highly It's a great job. And people yelling at you a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thinking they can do your job I, what, better what than more, you. Right. What more can you ask for? Right, right. Everybody hates you. <laughs> right, right. So you're doing your job. It's when you tough know to everyone please hates all the you. people all the time. Yeah. Hey, thank all of you for joining us. Uh, Daryl Ehrlich from the uh, Billings Gazette, Jackie Yamanaka, Yellowstone Public Radio, and John Stepanek, KTVQ News Director. Thanks for joining us on Face the State. Have a great week. You've been watching Face the State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.